seven. Fishing in DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only seven Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you will receive 5% off your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off your orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll gain access to our Facebook-only community, You'll gain entrance to our weekly and monthly prize giveaways, specific members only content, and so much more. Again, we are only seven Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And like I said a month ago, it's this time of year where the Potomac River gets beaten like a $20 hooker with a big tournament every weekend, (laughs) culminating in the Toyota Series. We've had like three BFLs already, ABAs, uh, Potomac teams, Battle of the Borders, and this place still dropped a 20-pound bag, which... None of us locals, I personally thought, would be able to do that with such a big tournament. And I have the winner on here, Michael Cat. Michael, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. So, really, before we kind of get into the tournament <coughs> stuff, like, how, how did how did you get your start in fishing? So, I always called. Uh, I always I, I grew up uh, with my dad. My dad taught me how to fish early in the age and. And uh, I started tournament fishing when I was 14 with him. And it just lit a fire under me after that. It was just fun to always compete. I've always been a competitor with a lot of things. I played baseball all my life. And then uh, fishing was just, I don't know, something that just pushed me to get better and better. And I've learned over the years. And then coming up as a co-angler, I was uh, I always called myself as a pro-co because I started dialing in things, learning things from these guys. It was it was fun and enjoyable to to be out there with these pros, and I knew one day I would just you know eventually step it up and stuff. But um, I had to take a small break for a few years. I had the family life going on, and then I came back to it full time. And uh, I moved up three years ago to a to a boater side, and I joined the MPFL, and I fished that and um, did real well that year. And but uh, I couldn't continue because I didn't have a title sponsor, which I'm still looking for a few more uh, to push me into 2025. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, it's just led me to here. I mean, being a co-angler meant everything to me to to learn from the back of the boat to get to the front. So that's actually how a little key process happened to allow me to win this event. So. Oh, really? Yep. Three, uh, it was about four years ago. You no, know, it was four years ago. I uh, drew a gentleman. Uh, I cannot remember his name. I will look back and get this guy's name, and I, I got to get in touch with him. But he took me to an area where I won at and showed me this creek, uh, this arm, this this stretch, I should say. And it was just the way you fish it. Um, he didn't dial it in like, you know, tell me everything like what I did, but the way he fished it was very, um, just very different. And, uh, I just, over the years I've dialed it in and it's been something really special. It's only like a two, 200 yard stretch and it's just really special place. I mean, it just the way it sets up and what the fish do every year at this time. Um, I mean, you wouldn't understand how many fish is right there. It's crazy. But thanks As to him, Florida I learned it. And that's something I definitely want to, we'll definitely get into. As a Florida boy, were you just specifically freshwater or, or did you actually really be a saltwater guy first that got you really passionate about it and then it, you jumped over to fresh? Because with Florida, it's a 50-50 split. No, unfortunately, I, I love saltwater fishing. I still go, I take my boys. My boys love to saltwater fish, of course, because they catch things all the time. Um, they don't have the patience to be a freshwater fisherman, but, uh, I love saltwater fishing. However, I did learn 
how to catch the largemouth in the back of these creeks when they're really salty. Like in the St. John's, we have some creeks that are very salty. You're not going to catch. You'll go into the creek and you'll catch snook and flounder and redfish. Then you get to the back and you're catching 20-pound bags largemouth. It's just the way the brackish water breaks up in there because they won't come out. They just they, that's they live back there. I don't know if you remember this, but the old uh, in fisherman books would always talk about how brackish water could never hold these big fish. Um, They were always stunted. And I know the Potomac uh, has dumped out a 10 pound largemouth. You look at some of these places, what is going on where these brackish places are just pumping out such good fish? Is it a lack of fishing pressure? I feel like, yeah, I would, I would be a hundred percent on that. I think it's a lack of fishing pressure. A lot of people don't want to do it. If you remember, I think it was 2006 or so. I've, I've talked with a lot of people. I'm pretty sure it was 2006. Skeet Reese ran down and won an event down there. And that's in yeah. and, and, well. So I've done my details in there and I've, I've found a couple of stretches in there. That's just amazing. I'm not going to give, I mean, Nanjamoy is huge. So I, you're not going to, yeah. like, I'm not going to just give that spot up, but um, yeah. So that's, that's pretty much where I was running and, it was just a, a phenomenal deal because it's been real special to me. It, yeah, we've been talking about that on the show here about those stretches, like how because so a little bit of history in Anjumoy. There used to be tournaments that were allowed back in Anjumoy when Skeet Reese won Thursday nighters that would basically stock the place because, like you said, there's a yeah. it's brackish they can't get back in there, and then Maryland banned it. And it's interesting <clears throat> how in saltwater places like that, how when you have big tournaments, it moves fish and then they kind of die. And you can really see that when you have the Sabine <clears throat> tournaments, uh, Winya Bay, where it does create transplants of fish like at spoiler, Matter Woman has a shit ton of fish 24 seven because every tournament on God's earth goes out of there. And it's just interesting how it makes that kind of that that setup like that when when you go from the St. John's to the Potomac, I, I know the St. John's the last five years, six years has had an issue with its SAV, its subaquatic vegetation. When you go from there to the Potomac, what similarities are there? So, unfortunately, the St. John's don't have anything like that anymore. We used to. Mm. When Hurricane Matthew came through, it wiped out all, everything that we ever had. Eelgrass, Hydrilla, everything. We don't. We didn't have nothing, not one inch of it anywhere. But thank God that the St. John's River. Uh, you know, we're all we got fences up now. We're we're coming back strong with some eelgrass here and there, and we got hydrilla coming back into the river system. So hopefully, in the near future, we'll get this stuff back. But we don't have anything like that anymore. Um, there's places like um, you know Rodman Reservoir who which we're getting all the grass back in there. That's, that's coming back full time. And, um, but it's coming back. It's going to be a great river system, but with, with Potomac now. So, you know, like last year, Greco flipping. I mean, I practiced that same stretch. I just didn't, I just didn't dial it in. I didn't put more time into that stretch. I didn't, but that stretch was long and it's a wall. I mean, it was so thick last year that, you couldn't, you couldn't even really run in that stuff or nothing. There was so much grass. And then this year was less. So I felt like this was, this was going to be a whole different kind of game field. You know, there's, there was still flipping going on. There was still frogging going on. I caught, I had a frog mat that was unbelievable. I didn't even get to fish it. I mean, once I ran down so far and I got what I had, I didn't need it. You know, I was saving it for the last day, to be honest with you, but I never got to utilize it. The, the Greco thing is interesting. After I interviewed him and we talked, I was like, I don't know a lot of lo- a lot of locals that punch consistently. Like it's such an oh, yeah. obvious thing to do in grass. And we, you know, we live on the Potomac, but he just, I don't know. He blew me away that he did the most obvious, duh, you do that in thick grass, but no one does it. it, it is that something that you guys routinely do down there? I know the St. John's is, is having issues right now, but is that still a big player? Oh, Yes. Yeah, we can still punch our pads, and there'll be floated mats here and there and stuff, but there's lots of places that you can still do that, and that is a big player. I mean, I, 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 there's no tournament that would go by that I wouldn't want a flipping stick in my hand. I love flipping. Flipping is my thing. Wow. I love to flip, and I love to finesse. So I'm sort of in, at the top and the bottom. I want a big weight, and I want a tiny weight. So 
<laughs> I like I like doing both of them. So when you get up to the Potomac, just in, in, in practice, how much time do you spend in grass before you make your decision that this is a stretch that's important? You know, and we, and we mentioned the previous Toyota winner. He didn't move very far when he got dialed in. And I just don't no. know how you guys do that to be like, hey, here's a 200-yard stretch. I'm going to spend eight hours here in the competition. It's like, how do you have the confidence to know, like, that just to me feels like such a gamble. A lot of it is a gamble. There's a uh, Potomac is different though. There's, you know, like my stuff. If you, if you went on past, like I, I fished thousands of yards of this stuff just to try and get more stretches and nothing. Mm -hmm. And it was just, they just, they do that. They set up differently. Once you catch one, there's another one there. That's just how that is. You catch a, you catch a good fish. There's going to be another one right there somewhere. And you catch this two pounder, there's probably going to be another two pounder there. I don't know why it, it is like that in Potomac, but some stretches are just absolutely clean dead. And then some of them will just be loaded. But like Greco, Greco's, Greco, he's a flipper. That, he's a, he's really good at that. And he's really smart. So not, I mean, I'm giving him props for a lot of that stuff, but I'm, I'll dial it in like that as well. I'll fish stretches until I get bit and then try and figure out why. And, um, uh, Okay. I think that there's a, there's always a key to why they're there. You just got to figure out why it might be a bend. It might be an outside, uh, outside current break. It might be the, the left bank, right bank of the, of the Creek. I mean, it, it, there's something that holds them there. And I, I don't, I know why my stuff was there, but like his stretch, I don't know how he had uh, dialed that in correctly, but I couldn't. I did fish it all. I fished it all the way down. Mm. But yeah, I, and I was thinking more of like the bigger mindset and tactics because it feels like flir flirting anglers are used to fishing in highly pressured situations with a ton of anglers because if they're there, that's where you got to be. And it, yeah. it seems like you guys just thrive at that because you come up here to the the Potomac river and granted every now and then things are one on sneaky spots, but a lot of times it's the obvious like, matter woman, Belmont Bay, like there's always a shit ton of boats, but it doesn't seem yep. to bother you guys. Is that just a, a mindset that you grew up with that? Yeah, there's boats yeah. around, but the fish are here. I mean, we have hundreds of boats that come to Florida and fish all around us. You just got to know how to fish it. And I think, I think you could go down the same stretch and not catch, but one fish and be like, okay, I'll wipe that off but I could go down it and do something totally different and I'll wreck them. Mm. So, I mean, it, Florida fish is, we just have, I don't know. You have to put a lot of patience into our fish, you know? I mean, you have to just slow down. <laughs> and that's what I did down up there. I slowed down and everybody else was going, the ones that I saw, I didn't want to see no more after I found these fish, but the people I did see just wasn't fishing it correctly. But all them fish were there. So, so g getting into your practice, um, and this is just in general uh, tactics and your mindset. How many did you want to stick in practice before you're like, I'm done. I'm leaving this alone. It, do you have a set number in mind, generally speaking? Three. I always, I always wow, go by damn. three. So, but I didn't do that this time. I honestly didn't. I, I huh. the. When I got to my stretch, I already knew this stretch was here. You know, I just wanted to check it. And okay. uh, I was in between two boats. One was just fixing to leave. He was literally sitting down leaving, and another one was way ahead of me. So I didn't worry about him. But once I got on my stretch, I like, I don't know, maybe seven casts in, I got bit. And I was like, okay, I'll check this one. It was a six, six, uh, six, five, six, six, something like that. And, um, I was like, okay, you know, maybe they're here. I went up to the next lay down and sure enough, one ate it and I, I shook it off and went to the next lay down, next lay down, next lay down. Every one of them I got bit on. Well, I pulled up one and it was like a four and a half pounder. And I was going to set the hook on it, but she was coming up. And when she came up, I seen her and she was like, I said, I'm not setting hook on anything else. It just, I just couldn't. So I, I went on down the stretch. I got like 10. Yeah, I mean, when you got quality fish like that and it was in the, the right timing because it was low tide and I knew if there was those two there, there's, there's more. That's just how the Potomac is. I mean, they just set up together like that. 
So I got about 10 bites. I went up to, um, I got a, had a grass stretch about another 75 yards up. And I went up to that one and there was some kayakers on it. And I was like, Hey, do you mind if I fish this corner real quick? And they're like, sure. We're just catching snakeheads and, and gar. And I looked up there with my forward facing sonar and, um, just, I was like, Oh my God, there was like 40 something fish up there. And I was like, could be catfish, could be anything, you know? I pitched up there, caught a two and a half pounder, pitched up there again, caught another two and a half pounder. And then I pitched up there again on the other side of the bend and it, I caught a three pounder and I was like, okay, I don't need to see any more. So I, I just got out of there so no one could see me, you know, no one could see what I was doing. I didn't want to mess with it anymore. I just already knew. So. So you knew that that was the place that you were going to start. When you deal with title uh, here, one strategy is even when you catch your fish, you, you got to play either defense or offensive in your strategy. Going into day one, and you know, with the weights you caught, was your mindset to just to leave and and keep it? You know, I don't want to touch any more of it, or was it like I'd rather sit here and play defense? Like, what was your mindset? So, <laughs> good thing is no one was there, not one person, yeah, and it and- does help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that helps a lot. Nobody was there. But in practice, when I first showed up, there was there was a boat on the outside coming in, and that was a ways back. But there was another boat in another creek I saw ways over. There was probably six or seven boats in that area that I saw during that time, and four of them was really close to me. But as soon as I pulled in, one left immediately. Another guy said, man, this is trash. I'm leaving. Uh, that last guy, I saw him sit down before I started practicing and he turned around and left and the other guy just went all the way to the back and came back out and said, it was just nothing there. So he left. Hmm. So I was just like, I never saw the one guy that shared this area with me. Uh, he must've found it later on. That was Jay Berger, but I have mad respect for him. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, um, it felt really good cause I was, a boat 120 and I was nervous that someone was going to be there. I mean, if there's, if you, the amount of fish that I found there, anyone would have showed up there. So mm-hmm. I was really nervous. Someone was there. No one was there at all. I got to fish everything by myself and uh, I had a hundred percent confidence in this place. Cause I knew what was going to happen when it got low. And every day, you know, it was a little earlier. It was like nine 30 on day one. 10:30 on day two and 11:30 on day three when that low tide hit. So uh, when I got in there, I didn't catch anything for the first 30 minutes, and then I caught one uh, on my grass stretch. And then it's just high tide. They don't really, I don't know. I didn't do as yeah. well on high tide, but I did catch my big fish on high tide. All my That's big fish came from high tide. Yeah, I don't. I'm still working on that. That's a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> So I get around to my wood stretch and very first fish I catch was at six eleven. So I was, so I was, that's the way to start a day. From a mental standpoint, cause I you know, generally, I think you have low tide spots and high tide spots. W- when would you consider that place? Like you said, a low tide spot. And did that kind of jar you a little bit when it's like, okay, well I'm catching them on high tide. What the hell's going on? Did you feel like that? Like, I mean, again, you caught 20 pounds, so it doesn't matter, but going into day two, were you thinking about readjusting your strategy? I did. Uh, I felt, well, actually, to be honest with you, it just made me feel that much more confident about the spot that I could catch them both ways because I never went back and practiced to try that in high tide. And I had no idea what, in my mindset, I knew exactly where the fish were. I knew when they were going to come out and what they were going to set up on. So in high tide, I knew where they were, but there was no way to get to them like that. Um, mm. I did not think any of that was going to go down like that. I mean, I had a limit before low tide and I had like 14 pounds and I felt great about that already. And then once I let it rest and I went up to my grass stretch in the bins and came back on low tide, it was just like whew, caught a four pounder. Wow. Caught another four pounder that took me up to, I was at 1912. I, I won't forget this at 1912. And I was like, man, what a, this has been a great day. And I started to leave and I said, I got to hit this last brush pile. And I caught another four pounder. And I was like, I, I got like 20 something pounds now because I had a three 
a 390 something and it only bumped me up a few ounces but i was like i cannot catch any more fish here i still had like two and a half hours and i was just like i told my co-angler too i was like man i'm gonna let you fish out this grass grass stretch with me but we're not gonna go back anywhere back over that stuff i, I can't mm -hmm. i gotta save it and he was like yeah man i wouldn't do any more you're catching fish you need tomorrow and i was like yeah so i only burnt like one fish that i probably could have used the next day but I was trying to be really smart on day one about it. So, cause I really felt the way it was going, I was going to have another 20 pound bag on day two. And honestly, mm -hmm. I, I really feel like I could have, cause I broke one off and it was heavy. Oh, shit. So, uh, well, all these lay downs, they have barnacles on them and they're like razors, man. You got to When they eat, you got to get them out, get them out quick. So was, was that early on day two or later when you had the break off? It was, uh, no, it was, it was, early it was somewhat early probably around 10 10 30. Ooh, that's, yeah that's emotionally jarring that's <coughs> yeah so and it was my second fish of that day that i broke off and it was heavy i just never seen it so i don't know i almost i don't want to i didn't want to see it to be honest i was better off not seeing mm. what what it was because there's so many snakeheads in there man you fight the oh, snakeheads and you can fight and I'll catch catfish too. But uh I, I've, how hard I was would, lucky enough. How how much was the break off an issue? Was that just two times it was a fluke, or was that an issue where you were thinking maybe like, hey, when I get to day three, maybe I should up my gear a little bit, or what was your thoughts there? So I was throwing seventeen pound test cigar braze X and I was throwing twenty pound test cigar braze X on both of my rods. And, um, I was throwing a seven, four heavy invoker pro arc rod. And, um, man, I mean, there's that a braze X is great. Like I, there's, I couldn't tell you how many times I put a, even that big one, that real big one, that six eleven. I put her in the boat and I had strands just all the way up the line, oh, you know? So you have to sit down and re oh. I'm constantly sitting down and recutting, uh, cutting and retying, man. Yeah. It's, it's, but you, you know, you, if the, you gotta, you gotta fish with the best to try and get them. So, I mean, I did, I did what I did and I constantly retied. <clears throat> so, but yeah, um, no, I, I think I broke off twice on day one, three times, three or four times on day two. And then, uh, once on day three. Yeah, I know it's, it's, how do you keep that together? Like, <laughs> I mean, honestly, especially when you crack a 20 pound bag and you're like, holy shit, I'm in this position and you go out there day two and then you swing and snap, swing and snap. I mean, how do you not snap your rod and just have a meltdown? How did you stay calm? I'm, I'm always calm. I've, I've calmed myself. I know I would never do something like that for one. I just, I don't have that anger in it i mean i want it and it's upsetting you know it's just what it is but i know it is what it is i knew going into it there was chances like that um but i did try with braid and they just wouldn't need a braid now i was throwing a uh one i was i was pitching in my heavy tops i was pitching a, a half ounce i mean a uh a one ounce medlock jig or the green pumpkin crawl trailer and i was catching them like that too but that's how I knew that every time I pitched that braid up to anything, they wouldn't really eat it. I caught one on the grass stretch like that. Um, that helped me on day three, but during practice and stuff like that, they just won't eat that braid, that braid. I just can't hide it. I've even taken a permanent marker and made it all black. Uh, I left it light green, you know, with a cigar smackdown. It's, it's a tough, tough braid and it's a great braid, but, if they would only eat it and if it was in thick tops, you know, where they couldn't, I don't know. I just felt like it was, it was a problem. So no matter what I had to use for it. So you, you crack 17 pounds day two, you know, you go from 10 to 17. <coughs> What's to, day two that night going into day three. Did you think at all about, do I have to adjust my strategy? Am I swinging for the fence to hit a 20 pound bag? Or do I feel like I just need to just be consistent and I got this thing? So I, I made a call that morning. I knew that I had it all to myself now, you know, cause Jay didn't make it. And, uh, 
However, on day two, his co-angler caught, you know, mad res- – okay, let me let me back up just real quick. On day two, I got to give him some credit because he had an earlier boat number to me, and we were sharing that area. He was not really fishing what I was fishing, but he was fishing stuff that I was fishing. And uh, I got there, and he was there like a few minutes earlier than me, and he wasn't even fishing. He waited on me to get there, and he asked me where I wanted to go. I swear. He, respect huge respect for him for being an angler like that and um i told him he was like okay and he fished that stretch and i fished my stretch and everything worked out great but uh his co-angler ended up catching a couple of giants he had a five and a four pounder that really would have boosted me over 20 if they you know if i would have got there because they would have ate yeah but that's how it is you know but on day three back to day three i felt really comfortable taking off knowing that i had everything to myself because there was no one else down there and um i did like i said i i had stuff out different places and i had a couple of walls that were had really big fish on them and i couldn't fish them all week because it was nasty waves were pounding on it uh my frog area waves were pounding on it i couldn't fish anything but on day three if i knew i could make it there it was going to be phenomenal in practice it was hot sunny calm phenomenal day three hot sunny calm phenomenal and and uh, I knew it was going to be phenomenal, but I was running to that wall. I was like, man, that wall will only take me like 10 minutes. And I was like, nah, just keep going. Just keep going. So I just, I just ran straight on down there and I gave up everything I had just to get down there. And I'm glad I sort of did because I caught two fish right off the bat, I had five pounds in the first five minutes. And uh, then it broke off a little bit until about nine 30, that high tide just got higher and higher and higher. And that's where it really scared me on day three because I was, I didn't know when it was going to break and come down exactly because down there I, I, I had first, first low tide before anybody did. Mm, yep, yep, so because yep. 90% of them or 95% of all the boats were up North and um, they would have that low tide later on before me. And so I jumped on it and at 10 45, uh, no, I'm sorry. 9:30. Uh, my co-angler caught three back to back, and one kept, and then I finally caught one for my third fish. And then the cameraman had to leave because he had to go do his thing. And then, like f- maybe 35 minutes later, it was just all the tide was changing. It was going out. The fish was turning on. I caught a five-two. Then I caught a four-one. And then with the only two big fish I had for that day, but I still anchored it up with another three pounder, which put me up to 16 something. So, and I called up by ounces all day. I was catching just, you know, here's another three ounces. Here's another four ounces. Here's another three ounces. Mm-hmm. So it was benefiting me all day, but when it went low tide, I'm telling you when it went low tide, we whacked them. We, we caught 25 fish. It was, it was crazy. And unfortunately, my really good thing. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Finish. No, I was just, I was hoping my co-angler, you know, he was sitting in first two. I've been there first place and then fishing behind someone like me. I'm not saying I'm, I mean, I gave him all the, everything I could do for him, you know, and I would want to, I wanted to see him succeed too, but he was just, every fish he caught was just small. It was under, it was 14 and a half, 14, three quarters, 14, seven, eights. I mean, it was, it's just, yeah. I hated it for him, but, and, but I wasn't leaving anything unturned. You know, I was picking it apart to make sure I got every beneficial bite I could. Um, but he did well. We had a great time. It was, it was a blessing. And it's for me, I mean, I knew if I ever won one, it was going to be there. It just always fished good for me. I fished there four times. I've cut a check there four times and, um, I've had two top tens and a third place and, uh, a, a lower 20 number. Uh, with the tackle warehouse pro circuit and then my win my win dude <laughs> did go, making that long run back to to Matta woman did you think you had it did you think you did did what you had to do yeah i i okay so i didn't in one sense because i i had mixed emotions man i I'm not going to lie. I had mixed emotions. I'm like, Tommy's going to have like, could have 19. 
But when I got to that 15 pound mark all day, I just had, I kept adding two pounds to everything I had. Okay. Tommy's got to have this. Tommy's got to have that now. He's now, he's got to have 14 pounds. Now he's got to have 16 pounds. But when I hit that 15 pound mark, I knew he was going to have to have a good bag. And, uh, it just doesn't happen like that a lot. You know, you, you normally on day one, you got to stroke them. You got to get them because on day two, you're not going to get these 19, 19, 19 pound bags because you're going to be resilient. Like me, I went right back to what I was doing. And honestly, I, I think there was 20 pounds, 20 pound bags there every single day. You just on the Potomac, that's unheard of, you know, even having a 20 pound bag is, I mean, look at those big events that were just fished there and they won it with 18 pounds on the Saturday as we were practicing. So <clears throat> and those are local sticks. Yeah, and I, and I mentioned this on a live stream, I think, two nights ago, where if it was, if there was no co-anglers, it shows you just how awesome the river is, where it, I think if you had no co-anglers, there would have been even more 20-pound bags caught. Um, so oh, the yeah. river's thriving right now, absolutely thriving. And it's, it is, and it's different. Every Almost every year I get there, it's different. It was just a lot, a lot of less grass in areas that normally produce that grass for the Potomac. And I feel like that scared a lot of people. Heck, I even heard somebody was fishing in 18 foot of water out in the river Yeah, on points. Yeah, and I was like, wow, point. never even, uh, yeah, I was like, man, that's something I would like to find, you know? It's crazy because I remember when I, th I think it was Dean Rojas back in, in the day was punching outside of uh, Aquia and now those those massive grass mats all the way up the gone. river they they are they're gone and they're gone we don't we don't know why um i've had tons of biologists on to explain this because it's the same thing with the, the saint john's like how do you make the grass come back like how can because it's 100 percent needed but it's made it a hard cover kind of place in a lot of areas and i feel it's the same as the saint john's when that mm -hmm. hurricane came in it pushed that salt water as far back as it's ever been and it ripped up and killed oh, so much stuff. And I think that's what's happened at Potomac too in that river. Not saying that because way up the river, that grass is gone too. So I'm not for sure exactly. I got stuff like almost to Washington that was really good for me in previous years. Um, but it's not there. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Certain sections are there, but it's not like it used to be. And, and the gold mines that you're speaking of outside of Quaya or um, – any of those right down there, Potomac Creek and yeah. So all those are all them grass flats. They're just gone. I don't understand. I can't find them. Even if there was some, it ain't much. I mean, I even, I practiced on a lot of those barges just because, you know, where are they, where are those fish at now? Where are those fish going? And I just wanted to get away from them crowds. Oh, you have to. I mean, that's, that's, and that's such a weird thing. It's like, when do you get, way from the crowds on the Potomac because there is always one person that feels like the top 10s out of Mad Woman, which is, if you guys don't know, it's like, of course, it's the most public yeah. hole on the world. But it's like, when do you do that versus when do you do risky? Because you also look stupid as hell if you're like, yeah, I drove to the Delaware River and I, <laughs> I didn't catch anything. <laughs> so it, it, that's such a fun, I don't know, when to stay, when to go. So I practiced Mad Woman and, but the very first day when I launched, I looked out in front of me and I was like, there's 20 people fishing right here. I, I'm not having a part of that. <laughs> this is going to be beat down. There's why fight through that. So I, I don't, I'm not that kind of guy. I don't like going and fishing in a pot of 20 people. That's just dumb to me. But I did go down mad a woman. I checked some stuff that I previously liked. I fished lay downs, caught fish. Uh, seen fish. I know there were some fish up there, but the quality of the fish just wasn't what I was looking for. And I mean, I went to the, as far back as you can get, I like shallow. So I knew some of these fish were still on the edge of spawn. There's always those later ones. And I was right. I mean, some of the fish that I caught, I'd get them, grab them and they'd be just peeing away. And that tells you, you know, those buck bass are still there. Some of these big females, they looked like when I was catching, they looked like they were already rode out, but some, one of them or two of them looked like they were ready. So 
I knew when they pulled out, they're still coming in, some of them. When you're talking about you picking apart hardcover, uh, laydowns, rocks, whatever it is, two things about that. How many how many casts or pitches flips do you go to a piece before you move on? And the second part of that is, do you turn off your electronics when you're that shallow? Because I know scope does have some benefit shallow, but is it is it is it outweighed by the noise? So I don't use I I um well I shouldn't say that I do use it on those shallow looking at the ends and stuff, uh, but I don't ever point it at them. It does have a ping and does I believe in 100 percent it has an effect. Uh, no, I did not turn it off. I don't know what would have happened if I turned it off, but I did utilize it to my advantage on on uh, tops, uh, not way up or something, just glancing and stuff. But I never pointed at them and turned it away. Uh, each top, I man. It's a good question because I've uh, one of the tops that I remember distinctively. I I pitched to oh man ten different ten different directions, and these are big tops now. You got to just get each leg, each arm, each little stick up, and uh, you never know exactly how they were setting up. Most of them were setting up in the front and down at the bottom, so you had to throw in front of it, let the let the tide. Uh, carry it underneath and just drag it really slow and they would be there. They would just load up. I mean, nine, nine out of 10 bites, I would never feel the bite. It would just be heavy. So that tells me I drug it right past their face and they ate it, you know, and they just sucked it up and I just feel them and they'd start swimming just a little bit and you got to get them as quick as possible because they're, they're going to be up underneath that stuff. But, oh man, it just depends on the size of the, the tree or top or, or the timber that I'm, I was fishing. So, but I would, I would, I would probably say anywhere from five to 10 flips on one tree. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause I'm just thinking about how much time, if you have 10 of them. So it's like, Holy crap. That's yeah. That's thorough as shit to work that many per. Wow. Dude. Well, that's impressive. I don't think I have the patience. And that 200 yard stretch, I don't have an act full number okay but i will tell you there's i don't have no more than maybe maybe 25 lay downs that's it Damn. so in that stretch that i'm i'm being dead honest i don't think there's but about 25 lay downs in my stretch that was it that's <laughs> I, I i wouldn't have thought that would be enough if i was at the same stretch being like there this is probably two hours maybe oh yeah it long, would take me versus it would like take me a gold mine yeah it would take me about an hour and a half each each pass it'd take me about an hour and a half to two hours to fish it i was so slow i would be more about an hour and a half it really to fish it and then i would fish that grass stretch same way be really slow so i took my time in it well, it, it absolutely paid off now. Um, you know, going back home, like what are your plans going forward for the rest of the year? Has, has this changed anything with your, with your tournament scheduling? Um, so I, I haven't really thought real far ahead with this yet, but I'm hoping that it opens up a couple more doors for me. Of course. I mean, that's, that's every angler's thing. And um, I am still looking for a few more sponsors to keep me pushing through 2025. Um, so that's always an option for me. And I hope that that happens. Um, but I'm still going to go, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go after angular the year right now and uh, the points race. So I'm heading up to Champlain and then I'm going to go to St. Lawrence river and I'm going to finish out my Southerns on Santee Cooper and maybe hopefully, I don't know, maybe jump in another one somewhere that I really like. I've been, I've been looking at the schedule, so we'll see what happens with that. If I can fit one in, but, um, other than that, it's going to benefit me more back home because, uh, there's some things that were going on and like with my mom and, um, I'm going to help them out a little bit. Uh, I know I didn't win a hundred thousand dollars or nothing like that, but it's going to definitely benefit me helping them with some stuff to get, make it a little easier for them. And, uh, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm working right now on getting a brand new boat so I don't miss out on my Phoenix deal again. I lost a lot of money in that, not having a brand new boat. So I've been trying to sell my boat right now for like 
11 months. So my, my boat's been up for sale forever and it's in a great price. I mean, I'm even, well, I've been trying to work with people and, uh, it's just the market's bad, you know? And, um, mm. I've been really trying to push it. I've, I'm willing to make a big deal. If someone wants to make a good deal with me, let's do it. You know, I just, I really can't afford two bass boats. So, yeah. but I am making it a point right now to figure something out. And I've already made a lot of phone calls about some stuff, trying to maybe even trade it in and just go ahead and get me in my new one. Cause I don't want to miss out on another 35 grand to be honest with you. Dude, that's freaking awesome. I mean, when it's your time, it's your time. Um, you know, yep. and really the last thing is really, I wanted to pick your brain about being a Florida guy. Does the Northern, what is your vibe on the Northern swing? Is it daunting I to love it. for the br the Brown ones? Okay. I love it. I've, uh, I have to keep saying this, this, a buddy of mine, Jeff Fitz. Okay. I'm going to throw his name out of Jeff Fitz is a good friend of mine. I grew, I've, I've grown up around him. He's, I traveled with him. He's an MPFL pro. Um, what a wonderful doc. This guy's done a lot for me. Huge, huge things for me. Uh, introduced me to the right people. He's put me in places that I need to know, taught me a lot of stuff, but anyhow, he said, Mike, let's go up North. What do you think? I was sketchy. I didn't want Why? I didn't have no idea about this years ago. It's probably been, I don't know, eight years now, nine years. I've been hooked ever since. I mean, we got to the St. Lawrence River that first time. He goes, drops a drop shot out by a can. And he puts one up. I said, it was that easy. And uh, we just, I don't know. I love the north. When it comes to smallmouth, y'all better watch out. <laughs> I, 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 I want to win one up there bad. I want to win a smallmouth event. But it takes a lot. Last year in Champlain, I thought I had a great bag, 18.9 on day one. No. <laughs> and then on day two, I had 18 something and didn't even make day three. So I need, you got to have a 20 pound bag when you get up there and maybe slip a little bit, but you got to keep that consistency up high, like 19, 20, 21 or higher to, to make it to day three. And you got to have a 20 something pound bag every day to think you're going to win them. Mm -hmm. but I love the small mount. I love Northern runs. It is interesting up there. It, it's uh, the people I've had on the show before said it, it's the best place to go. Cause even if you don't do well, you still had fun. It, there's so many places you go fish and you're like, shit, absolutely there. But, but that place is like, yeah, this is a vacation spot. Like I'm still going to have fun going up there and sticking them a hundred percent. Absolutely. Michael, I, I really appreciate the time. I know you're a super busy man. Um, is there anyone that we can promote sponsor wise or, or, or people in your life? Well, I just want to throw out there that, you know, I am like, again, I'm, I'm looking for an, a tile sponsor for next year to help me through the 2025 year. If anybody's interested, hit me up Uh big shout out to bruiser baits. Uh, I won those baits or I won off those baits and uh, the drop shot and the bruiser hog. Those two baits were my key baits, and y'all need to go check out bruiserbaits.com. Check them out. Flat out tungstens, bass addiction gear. Uh, Seaguar made everything happen for me as well. Um, my arc rods, uh, I was throwing a 7.4 heavy uh, Invoker Pro rod the whole time and a 7.2 medium heavy fast spinning rod when I was doing my drop shots. Um, check them out. Gravity reels made by arc. Y'all got to check them out. They're awesome. Um, the drag system on the spinning reels, we have 2,500s, 3,500s. Those are great reels. Um, they're all new, but the drag system in it alone is our own patent. And same with our reels. We have our own patent in our drag system. So it's it's a floating drag system. It's amazing. I um, also want to give a shout out to Owner Hooks and 44 Tackle, uh, MGM Cole Tags. They're a big sponsor of mine, Coast, uh, Phoenix, Mercury, um, Bob's Machine Shop, Dakota Lithiums has been a really big sponsor of mine this year. I want to give them props because those batteries are amazing. I've, I've went days without having to charge them. So I just want to give all of them a shout out for sure. And um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Flambo and AFCO. Too, I, I wear nothing but AFCO. They keep me dry and, and my elite bibs and even though I got had to, I had to use them for two days in a row, so they kept me dry while I fished, and yeah, that's uh, they keep me clothed, that's for sure. That's that's pretty much it. Well, 
Dude, that's freaking awesome. And then, uh, guys, again, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. Go help support him. You know, in 2022, it was Harry Lingsenberg that won it. In 2023, it was Christian Gecko. And then Florida Boy, number three this year, Michael Catt takes on the Toyota. There's something in the water down there because they can travel the 300 miles and kick our asses up here 24-7 on the Potomac. Dude, congratulations. As always, guys, uh, like and subscribe really helps out in the algorithm. Check out the links down below, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.